What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekaWatt video. In this video, I've challenged myself to build the ultimate white themed gaming PC build with an RX 7900XDX, Ryzen 9 7950X3D, and this. Let me grab it, the brand new Height Y70 Touch. One of the most insane PC cases I've ever seen. It's got a 4K touchscreen on the front. What? Let's do this. The Cooler Master Cube 500 flat pack is a case that lets you do it yourself with support for full size specs in a compact form factor. A highly adjustable design lets you build as you unbox and it really is like nothing else. What's more, support for up to E80X motherboards, 360mm long GPUs and a 280mm AIO up top make it super versatile for the latest components. Build it your way with the Cooler Master Cube 500, now available in black, white and macaron. Check it out at the first links in the description below. I'm going to split this video down into two key sections. First, I'm going to run through all the parts that make it possible, why I chose the parts I did, and even give you guys some alternative choices for good measure. And then second, I'm going to see how the whole thing looks and performs in all of the latest titles. But let me begin by talking a little bit about this new case, the Height Y70 Touch. Height, which is owned by iBuyPower, has been on a bit of a roll recently, creating the Height Y60, my favourite case ever, it's what I'm still rocking in my personal gaming setup at home, and the Y70 looks to build upon the Y60 in a fairly modest way. We see a slight size increase which is going to further the cooling capacity of the case. It should allow for plenty of intake at the bottom, plenty of exhaust at the top and even 360mm radiators on this sort of rear side piece. You obviously get that sort of fish tank like aesthetic where you've got panels and panels but they've replaced the front glass panel with a touchscreen. This is something that users that were buying the Y60 were doing already and it was something I considered doing for my own Y60 but then this came along. Now in typical typical height fashion, they haven't exactly gone and done this by halves. Not only is it a touchscreen, pretty cool, you're thinking James, yeah, and 4K touchscreen. What? 10 point multi-touch, aka you can have all 10 fingers on here and moving around, and it links with their new Height Nexus software. This is something I got a look at at Computex earlier this year. It's the software they're going to kind of be building up upon with all of their new releases and ecosystems. My first impressions then were that it was very, very good for an early stage bit of software, and hopefully it's still good now. The there are obviously some interesting trade-offs that then this does come with, I suppose, the screen. It isn't cheap. This case retails for around $350. Now, yes, that's a lot of money, but it's Corsair IQ 5000T territory. And if you said to me, James, this or a 5000T, probably going to pick something aesthetically, at least, that looks like this. Let's open her up and see how the whole thing works inside. So fully taller side panels out of the box, plenty of ventilation while also not looking like one big piece of mesh. The top piece should also just pull off pretty easy. Yeah, look at that. Simple. This is, of course, a dual chamber design. So the PSU goes here and then we've got room for hard drives if you want to put hard drives. I suppose you kind of need hard drive space in some capacity in a case this expensive. And then the glass panels at the front should also pop off pretty simple. The piece of glass just here is also removable, but there should be no real reason to take that out. And then what's interesting is behind the screen, you've got a mini display port and a USB-C connection. The USB-C connection is going to go presumably to your USB-C header on the front of your mother board while well, the mini display port goes into this half height PCI lane at the back allowing you to presumably use this as either an external display or as a USB-C interface via the height Nexus software and we'll look a little bit at that later on. Now full size ATX motherboard support you can get 360 mil rad at the side here which is what I think I'm going to do but beware if you do this you're going to want that to be in intake rather than exhaust as that's kind of the whole point of a chassis like this one. Motherboard tray is well marked and a vertical GPU mount is standard with the the Y60, the Y40, and this case, there is no option for horizontal mounted GPUs. You get PCI lanes that are here, but they're half height, meaning they're only good for like a Wi-Fi or a networking card with an adapter. They're not going to fit graphics cards. The good news is that you get one, two, three, four full height PCI lanes, plus probably another PCI lane worth of space. So big triple slot, 40 series, 7000 series cards will be fine. And of course, this prevents GPU sag. It looks nice. It's just a really good solution, in my opinion, to modern large size GPUs. I'm already a fan it is expensive and that isn't going to be
be for everyone. But we'll look at it and see how it actually is to build in as we progress. For now though, let's look at some of the other parts. So motherboard wise, the Asus Prime X670E Pro is the motherboard that I've selected for this build. Now, the only thing to note about this board is that it's not the most high-end X670E design out there. And a lot of the choice for this board has been motivated by the aesthetics. I'm not planning on overclocking my X3D CPU anyway, so it's gonna be fine. But if you are looking to push to the max, this is not the board I would go for. CPU installation is obviously pretty easy. I'd like to hope if you're building a five grand PC or however much this ends up costing, probably more like three and a half K, but you probably know how to install a Ryzen CPU at this point. RAM, I've got, no, I've got the wrong RAM. Hang on, bear with. Ow! Aha! I found the right memory. I'm going to go for two kits of the XPG Lancer RGB. That's because 64 gigs, which is perfect. Not only for gaming, obviously 32 gigs is fine, but also for the likes of video editing, rendering, productivity. No one's building a Ryzen 9 PC for gaming alone. At least they weren't the last time I checked. You probably shouldn't. You don't need to if it's gaming is all you're after. Yep, 32 gigs of RAM does the job. And this is Expo memory as well for good measure. There's something quite satisfying about clicking all four dims in one by one. Oh, I missed a bit. Yeah. SSD is going to be next. Mission failed. Try that again. SSD is going to be next. The Lexar NM790. That was better. This is a two terabyte Gen 4 NVMe. Now you could go Gen 5. Where I recently looked at the new XPG Gen 5 drive and also the Crucial, the Crucial T7, T700. They're good, but they're not ready yet. And they run so hot. They need fans on some of them as well as large heat sinks that Gen 4 is going to be perfectly fine. We don't need the extra speed, although handy for video editing or gaming at this point. As the drives come down, get cheaper in price, more affordable, then obviously they will be considered for builds like these. But currently, too expensive, too hot, and a bit of a faff. With that sorted, pretty much done here. Gonna add some CPU cooler mounting hardware. So why not talk about the cooler before I go ahead and do that? This is the Deepcool LS720WH. Now, you might wonder why I've picked this particular option when the white fans aren't RGB or particularly exciting. Well, earlier, I mentioned that we'll be using that 360mm rad in intake. If we do that, we can hide these fans at the back, go for a push pull config, bring in extra airflow, and of course, they're still useful to have. I like the water block design, I like the radiator design, just pretty perfect, all in all. Inside the box, you get the, what looks to be an Intel bracket, but this is an AMD build, so we're not gonna need that. I think actually what we will need is the information and support. Is this a manual? Yes, aha, marvelous. So if you've got plastic brackets, then you want to remove these from the screw threads and add in the AMD specific screws instead. Aha. Uh -huh. In particular, these are the screws that you need. Before moving this into the case, I am just gonna pop on the AMD brackets as well, and they go onto the bottom of the cooler. Now I think this actual sort of top plate, yeah, so that just comes off. We'll keep that to one side for now, and that's just gonna make fastening things to the cooler itself far, far easier. Then the case is gonna come back into the equation for the installation of the motherboard assembly. So, always good to lay the case flat. One of the oddities of this case is that the sort of vertical GPU mount kind of gets in the way at this stage. So unscrew that, pull it out, and just sort of hold it out the way for the next step. Then it's a case of grabbing the motherboard, sliding it in. There we go. Line up with the rear IO shield. Once the actual screws for the motherboard are in, this can also go back in at the same time into the top PCI slot to keep it out the way and enable the vertical GPU mount to work a bit later. Nine screws, three in the middle, three across the top, three across the bottom, and then it's party time. As far as the radiator goes, I'm going to start by installing all of the Corsair QL Edition fans on the front facing side of the radiator in intake. That's pulling air through the rad. Once those three fans are on with the cables neatly managed to the sort of left hand side of the radiator, I'll add in the stock deep cool fans while clamping the whole thing to the Y70. Support for a 360 mil rad in this position is really impressive. The top mount is also a good option if you want to go for that. But I think a side mounted option is a little bit different. And the whole point of today's build is to just go that step further. Once the radiator's in, you can step back and admire hard work, but not for too long as it's GPU time. Yes, very excited. So Radeon RX 70. 900 XT power color Howhound. What more is there to say? If you want a 4K GPU and don't want to spend 40 90 money, this is what I would buy. And this beautiful white version from power color, it looks so good. And it's going to really, really work in the system today. Let's just hover it in, have a bit of a taste of what we've got ourselves in for. Oh, yes. 
Look at that. Now the GPU is like sl very, very, very slightly off-white, at least the plastic. The back plate's a little bit more crystal clear, but the cooler is a similar sort of minorly beige tone. So it might actually work quite well. Couple of PCI lanes to remove, push the clip back on the retention slot, and then the GPU goes in nice and easy. I have to say that is looking mighty fine. Next stage is the power supply. <laughs> I might have screwed up here. I might actually have messed up. Now in order to find out if I've messed up, I need to actually take the power supply. So this is the Corsair Shift RM1200X. And aside from being frankly a little bit overkill for this build, it also has sideways mounted cables. And I'm not sure whether or not that's gonna work in this case. Okay, no, it looks like it will. Panic averted, but we are gonna have to put the cables in before putting the power supply in, which is kind of the whole opposite idea of the actual Shift power supplies in the first place. So cables first, then the PSU can go in. Probably don't get the Shift version. I actually think it makes things more complicated in this case than easier. I'll link alternatives down at the affiliate links in the description below. Also, you don't really need 1200 watts. A thousand's fine, but I want the option to potentially swap some bits out in this build later down the line and the price difference wasn't that big at the time of purchasing. I'm also gonna add in some easy DIY fab cable extensions and a few more of these. I've got those white fans, Corsair QL editions, three for the top, one for the back. It's gonna help with airflow, obviously, but it also looks good and fills what is a very, very large case. And with that, it's pretty much good to go. And I'm super excited to try the screen out. First, uh, allow me a few minutes to wire this thing up and then let's have a play. <laughs> Before taking a deep dive into performance, I do want to take a look at the screen on the Y70 Touch. Now this is a 4K 10 point multi-touch display. Now what that means is you can use all 10 fingers, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can interact with it, it's super responsive and connects up via both an internal USB-C header and a DisplayPort cable. The DisplayPort cable enables you to use this as a separate monitor and you can put whatever you want on here as you normally would within Windows, but you can also load up Height's Nexus software, which I think is personally the most useful to adjust custom widgets, monitor CPU and GPU usage, change your music on Spotify. It really is impressive. I mean, it's even got a game of Tetris built in. It's really very cool. Some might think this is a bit of a gimmick, but actually I think as long as you mount or store this PC on top of a table where you can easily access and use the screen, I think it could be a really useful way of monitoring all your important PC information, changing your music while you're gaming, especially for those of you rocking only a single ultra wide monitor as an example. That just leaves us with the performance to check out. I've tested this build with a wide range of titles to see just how well it's stacks up, starting with Starfield at 4K high settings to really push things to the max. Here the build achieved over 100 FPS, 102 frames per second on average, with 93 and 85 for the 90 and 99th percentiles. Move through into Hogwarts Legacy once again at 4K and the build achieved at high settings and 94 FPS average. 90 and 99th percentile results were good and as always we use both Reva Tuner and Nvidia frame view side by side to capture all of the FPS data. Warzone 2 at 4K high with FSR set to quality on the 7900XDX delivered 135 FPS on average with 126 and 111 for the 90 and 99th percentile results while moving through into Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings yielded over 300 FPS on average. Always like to test this for a bit of fun, see how high we can push the frame rate. The answer, very high indeed. Apex Legends at 4K high and the build pulled in 244 FPS on average, 90 and 99th percentile results in the region of 223 and and 195. This is a build that really does mean business if you're looking for top end performance in a form factor that looks cool and has the really unique selling point that is the 4K touchscreen on the Y70 Touch. What do you think? Would you buy this build? What do you think of the case in particular? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching though and as always we'll see you in the next one.